Hi, everybody. Thank you, Harley, for that introduction. <clears throat> so um, I wrote this book. Um, it took me seven years. Um, and uh, so I'm thrilled to, to not be writing this book anymore. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was, I was in this room talking about, um, about Peruvian prisons. I had just published a piece in, in Harper's Magazine um, about my, uh, my, my time uh, inside Lurigancho, which is one of the largest prisons in, in, uh, in Peru, probably the largest prison and most notorious prison in Peru. Um, and I spent some time there as a reporter um, and uh, written a piece for Harper's. When I wrote that piece, I really, I was in the midst of a really serious creative crisis. I had finished a version of this novel uh, at the end of 2010. Um, or read it, and it was just terrible. It was just a, a really, really horrible piece of writing. A uh, very, very boring book. Um, and so I set it aside for about six months and pitched this piece to Harper's, and then went down to Lima and spent a lot of time inside the prison. Um, and, uh, and I had no way of knowing at the time that this was going to completely transform the book. Um, I knew I didn't want to give up on writing the book. I just didn't know exactly what I was going to do to make the book uh, readable or interesting to me or, or, or to anyone else. Um, but what ended up happening, uh, and this often happens if you do any kind of in-depth uh, investigation or, or immersion type journalism, is that you have a lot of stuff that's, that's extra, extra stuff that's, uh, that um, can't fit in a 6,000 word piece or can't fit in a radio piece, or, um, but it's there. And its atmosphere, and its context, and its detail, and its its you know sometimes human anecdotes and stuff like that. So um, this novel, uh, even in its first sort of flawed iteration, was about a young man named Nelson. Um, and uh, Nelson is the kind of young man like a lot of us uh, who kind of uh, flows and and uh, drifts through his early adulthood um, and doesn't really make any choices. Um, and, and is kind of wasting his, his youth, as often happens. Um, in his particular case, he's waiting for a particular, he's for, for a reason. His brother has moved to the United States when, when, uh, when Nelson was quite young, and he's waiting around for a visa. He thinks that the visa is going to come at any moment. And so because there's no real urgency, uh, he has no real urgency to do anything concrete in his current life, because at any given moment, he's going to have to leave anyway and start over in the United States. So why bother? Um, uh, Nelson's an actor, and the section I'm going to read has to do with acting. But I wanted to point out this connection between the prisons and, and the stories, because Nelson is just a, a huge admirer of this man named Henry Nunez, who you're going to meet in a second. Henry Nunez is an older playwright uh, from a, you know, a generation removed from, from Nelson. He's, uh, he's a, a very, uh, he was a very controversial playwright. He produced a play in the 80s called The Idiot President. And um, the idiot president uh, landed Henry Nunez in jail. Uh, and this was all something that I, I sort of uh, had known about Henry when I wrote that first draft. But it wasn't really that important, because Henry wasn't a very important character. Um, he was just kind of a minor mentioned character. In the new version of the novel, the version that, that, I, that I ended up publishing, I discovered that Henry was very important. Um, that, uh, that the tour itself was very important, that this was, this was a, a, a critical experience in Nelson's life, and I had to dramatize it. And, um, and I discovered that Henry Nunez had, had spent time in, in this prison named Collectors, which is based directly on my experiences in Lurigancho. Um, because I don't want to bring you all down, you seem like a really nice group of people, I thought I might read a different section of the book, I read something that's a little bit more uplifting. Um, but basically, what we have is a young man named Nelson <clears throat> who has broken up with his girlfriend. He's waiting for his life to begin. He uh, decides that he's going he's gonna to do something. And what he ends up doing is, is uh, auditioning for revival of the idiot president uh, with this legendary theater troupe, Diciembre. And much to his surprise and delight, he gets the part. So this is going to represent, for him, the first time he's going to leave the city his first sort of real professional acting gig, and it's with his mentor or with his hero to boot. So he's quite, he's quite thrilled. Um, he is, however, still dealing with you know, all the other baggage that, uh, that's going to come back and, and catch him, but not in this section. So you're totally good. <laughs> the bus arrived in San Luis at dawn, stopping at the town's central plaza, where they were met by Pata Larga's cousin, Cayetano. 
It was far too cold out to be chatty, and while they waited for the bags to appear from the storage compartment beneath the bus, Nelson observed his new surroundings in silence. The light was gray and thin, mist still clinging to the hillsides, but there were small houses dotting the slopes and footpaths snaking between them. Those must be the suburbs, he thought. On the western side of the valley, the terraced hills were dark with recently tilled earth, and he could make out a few human shapes, farmers moving about in the half-light. It had rained overnight, and the streets were rutted and pooled with water. At the far end of the plaza, a woman in traditional dress swept her front steps with a broom that seemed taller than she was. From a distance, it was impossible to tell if the broom was over large or if she was just very, very small. Cayetano announced that he was taking them to the market first. They needed to eat something. If not, the altitude would get to them. Everyone agreed. Cayetano wore a long, padded brown coat and reminded Nelson, that reminded Nelson of a chess piece, a rook, perhaps. They thought about waiting for a moto taxi, but decided against it. Standing still in the cold wasn't such a good idea. And anyway, Cayetano said, it isn't far. It only seems that way. The three actors ambled behind their host through the town's mostly empty streets, Nelson and Patalarga each carrying one strap of a green duffel bag the length of a corpse or a small canoe. It swung between them as they walked, inside with their supplies, their costumes, the president's long boots, his white gloves, the smock, the colorful pants, and the rubber sandals Patalarga would wear every evening and many days for the next two months. There were even a set of modified tent poles and a blue tarp which they could use as a canopy if they were called upon to perform in a light rain. Needless to say, the bag was heavy. Henry Nunez, who had fully assumed the role of the president from the moment he boarded the bus, carried only his backpack with a few books and pens and walked a few steps ahead of the other two, gazing idly at the buildings. He wore the white eye mask raised to his hairline like a headband. Now and then he would make a comment, what large windows, or look at the workmanship on that wooden door to which no one felt the need to respond. Everything in San Luis was wet. The gravel streets, the walls of the houses, the hills, the stray dogs, the puddles on the empty shadowed street seemed bottomless. It's been pouring every night, Cayetano said. The rainy season had started late that year, but now it had come with a vengeance. Oh, the rain, said Henry. They walked for much longer than seemed possible and ne until Nelson began to doubt in his bones and in his gut the very existence of a market. But it was there, in fact, at the edge of town, a squat concrete building painted blue, topped with a corrugated metal roof. The market was just opening, and it was smaller, and it was a smaller but still inspired replica of that city market near where Ixta had realized that she was in love. Here, vendors unpacked boxes, sliced meat, unloaded vegetables from wooden crates, and Cayetano led the visitors through the corridors until they stopped before a clean, white-tiled counter stacked with elaborate pyramids of fruit. The woman working there greeted Patalaga with a shout and came around the counter to welcome him properly. She wore her hair in a long braid and had a bright silver pendant around her neck. She was Cayetano's wife, Melissa. She embraced Patalaga, greeted Henry with a similar enthusiasm, and offered Nelson a somewhat formal handshake. There was a baby in a bassinet, a little girl named Yadira, asleep in the corner of the market stall. His two other children were at home, Cayetano said, preparing the house for their arrival. While Melissa made juice, they discussed their plans. Henry noted he hadn't seen any posters announcing the performance, not on their walk or at the market which he found puzzling. A bus ride into the tour and already he'd acquired the arrogance of a president. Nelson was impressed. Cayetano's lips stretched into a thin smile. He unzipped his heavy brown coat and sighed. The mayor, you see, he wanted to speak with you first before we planned the performance, just to be sure it was appropriate. Henry scowled. Appropriate how, Patalarga said, his voice rising. No dancing girls, no blood. So it hasn't been planned, Henry said. Cayetano shook his head. Not yet, not exactly, but we'll talk to him. He's eager to talk. He loves to talk. This afternoon, everything will be fine. Melissa served them more of the local breakfast cocktail. Henry and Patalaga muttered between themselves. We'll talk to him now, Henry said. The mayor, where can we find him? Cayetano looked down at his watch, but it's only seven. The people's work begins early. Why don't you have a rest first? Look at the boy. I'm fine, Nelson said. We'll take him to the house. I'm fine, Nelson insisted. Patalaga nodded reluctantly. Henry, however, shook his head. He patted Nelson on the shoulder as if to show he understood. Then he climbed upon the stool where he'd been sitting. No one had a chance to stop him. He began shouting for everyone's attention. He clapped his hands, asked for a moment. The market workers, along with the shoppers who'd wandered in, slowed now and looked up. Dear residents of San Luis, 
my two colleagues and I, stand up, Nelson, stand up, Pata Larga. He waited for them to climb up on their stools before continuing. Together, Henry announced, shouting, we are Diciembre. You may have heard of us. We are a theater company from the capital. We would be honored to perform for you this evening at 6 p.m. in the plaza, weather permitting. Please come and bring your families. Thank you. Then he sat down. Nelson stayed up for just a moment longer, surveying the market. From this vantage point, he was able to register with great clarity the muted reaction to Henry's announcement. There was no romance associated with the name Diciembre. There might be elsewhere, in towns all across the region, but not here. Instead, there was a pause, a collective head scratching, and then a quick return to the normal rhythms of the market. Vendors resumed their tasks. The handful of early morning customers went back to their shopping. Nelson quickly became invisible. Eventually, Patalarga helped him down. He and Cayetano received the young actor into their arms, and Melissa gave him tea. Why does no one believe me, said Nelson. I'm fine. Good, Henry said without smiling, because we have a show tonight. When mapping out their itinerary, Henry and Patalarga had selected San Luis for three reasons. First, a matter of nostalgia. Diciembre had played a show there 19 years prior on the very first tour into the interior. They had fond memories of the place, its placid river, the few cobblestone streets remaining in the center of town, and an old pretty church with a leaky roof. Compared to the dreary mining camps they'd visit later, San Luis was positively picturesque and therefore a good place to begin. Second, it was well located, just off the recently repaved Central Highway, a smooth six-hour ride from the capital. Third, the presence of Cayetano, who'd been loosely associated with Diciembre in the early days, though more as a drinking partner than as an actor. He wasn't just Patelarga's cousin. He was an old friend with a rich understanding of Diciembre and its history. The years had been kind to him. He had a family now, had inherited his father's land and money enough to become a prominent member of the community. The war had ended, and the new highway allowed his produce to arrive in the city overnight. Cayetano had risen to the position of deputy mayor of San Luis, something unthinkable to those who remembered the bearded, poorly dressed young poet known for staggering through the pre-dawn streets of the capital back in the early 80s. But then, no one thought I'd be a science teacher, Henry said during our interview, and no one thought you'd be. He frowned and looked over at me with an ungenerous eye. Well, he said, you aren't anything yet. I let this go. Whatever the case, they'd counted on Cayetano to make things run smoothly. They'd expected to be on the road for six weeks or more, so it was important to get a good start. They left Nelson at the house to rest now, and the elders of Diciembre went off to speak with Cayetano's boss and patron, the mayor. The mayor opened by saying he was not hostile to art per se, and from there, things only got worse. He smiled often, but never warmly, tapping his long, slender fingers on his desk as he spoke. He described a number of killings that had taken place in the area since Diciembre's last visit in 1982, with a tone that implied that the first event somehow was somehow related to the others. Patanaga later admitted that his mind wandered throughout the speech, that he found himself looking out the window at the church with the leaky, leaky roof and above at the sky and all that was only then beginning to clear. It was mid-morning. Patalaga's wife, Diana, was surely awake by now, perhaps still in bed, enjoying the silence of an empty house. Their theater, the Olympic, was locked up and empty, costing him money every minute of every day. For no good reason, he remembered his childhood in the mountains, on the whole happy memories, and his early schooling, during which he'd been subjected to long-winded harangues not unlike this one. He had a teacher who was a communist, another who was a reactionary, and both were living abroad now in Europe. In a week, Patalarga would see his mother, and as always, the thought filled him with ambivalence. He pressured Henry into this tour, presenting it as something his old friend had to do for himself, for his art. But as the mayor prattled, Patalarga realized that, in fact, he was the one who'd wanted it. He'd wanted it badly. It was to be young again, a way to escape the city for a spell and relive times which, though difficult, constituted the central experiences of his otherwise uneventful life. The war years, he told me when we spoke, it's not that I miss them, not at all, but I remember them, every last detail. It worries me, but sometimes I feel like everything else is a blur. Does that make any sense? I shook my head. Honestly, I didn't understand. I was just a boy, I explained to him, and then we were silent for a while. In San Luis now, the mayor's concern was the title of the piece. Idiot, the mayor said. If at school my son were to call another student an idiot, the teacher would send a letter home, and the child would be punished, would he not? Cayetano furrowed his brow. Your son is 22 years old, sir. 
the mayor glared. As usual, my esteemed Cayetano, you are missing my point. He turned to Henry. Are you a father, Mr. Nunez? I am. And would you not punish your child if he, she, Henry corrected. The mayor paused as if having a daughter had never occurred to him. If she said something like that to a classmate, Henry thought of his daughter Anna, who was too smart to toss around insults like that thoughtlessly. If his daughter were to call someone an idiot, it meant they were an idiot. <laughs> he opted not to say this. But Mr. Mayor, is a place subject to the same codes of behavior as a child? The mayor frowned, paused, wrapped his long fingers around a glass of water. I don't know the answer to that. If, I, if he was an imbecile, at least he was honest. He took a sip of water. Henry felt he'd scored a point and opted to forge ahead. After all, he was the president, and it was his role to defend his play, his partners, their art form. He intended to be respectful, to negotiate this fine balance between the ego of a small town mayor and the needs of a theater collective like Diciembre. What, Henry argued, is a play without an audience? Is in a script simply potential energy until that magical moment when it becomes something more? Isn't alchemy like that the only, poss only possible when the words are made real, when the actors step out from behind the curtain or the tarp, in this case, and perform? Henry could feel himself gaining momentum as he spoke. Every audience is different and every audience is a gift which can never be overlooked or taken for granted. As for Diciembre, here they were. Here we are, Henry said, perhaps a bit too loudly, and they'd come to San Luis for an audience to transform the virtual into the actual. They had hoped to use the recently remodeled school auditorium, but they would perform this piece one way or another in the plaza, in the market, in the street beneath the pouring rain. They'd do it at Cayetano's home if they had to. The mayor smiled. Perfect. Do it at Cayetano's house. He stood. Gentlemen, have a wonderful day. I wish you much success. Prepare for the show, Patalanca, Cayetano, and Nelson spent part of the afternoon carrying furniture outside and covering it with December's tarp in case of rain. They cleared as much space as possible in the house, making room for an audience that would be forced to sit on the floor. While they worked, Cayetano apologized for what had happened. Their play, he explained, had fallen victim to a rivalry that had emerged in recent years between him and the mayor, a dispute about land. These things are common in small towns. He began to go into details, but then stopped himself. You know what? It's not interesting, not even to me. Meanwhile, Henry put on his presidential riding pants, the ruffled shirt and long coat, the leather boots, the white gloves and sash, and he went down to the market once more. Everyone, everyone stared at me, he reported. They stopped me and they asked where I'd come from. It was wonderful. This time, there were more people around, and the market was louder and more alive. Melissa borrowed a bullhorn from another vendor and announced Henry to the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, the president. With the people's attention, Henry once more clambered atop a stool and spoke of Diciembre, the play, its surprising change of venue. There was a buzz this time. Who is that oddly dressed man? And what exactly is he talking about? And when he finished, Henry bowed, taking care not to lose his balance, and received the tour's very first round of applause. According to Patalarga, Nelson was both nervous and determined not to appear so. He was not a complete novice. After all, he performed in a few of the capital's more storied theaters. But this was undoubtedly different, Patalarga told me. The intimacy of it, the nearness of these strangers, the way they looked at you, it couldn't have been easy for him. Did Nelson flub his lines? He did. Did he miss his cue for the fight scene? He did. Did he see the faces of his audience and feel them close, smell their presence in the room and long for the trappings of those theaters he knew back home? He did. But he pushed through all that. And by the time the mayor appeared midway through the first act, Nelson had almost recovered. Things were humming along. The mayor, full of bluster and pique, seemed unimpressed. He made his way to the corner opposite the door and stood against the wall with his arms crossed, frowning. Nelson had no idea who this man was and later claimed it was mere coincidence that his line, but father, you must be careful, evil lurks everywhere, <laughs> was delivered with eyes locked on the latecomer. But everyone noticed and Cayetano laughed nervously and soon the entire room was laughing along with him, everyone but the mayor. This is what Nelson had to learn, Patalarga told me later, that the play is different every time, that it doesn't matter if you mess up, that there's no such thing as a mistake. The mayor stormed out well before the climactic murder scene. It was just as well. There was more humor at his expense once he'd gone. A gentle rain began moments later, just as Patalarga's character was stabbed. It tapped pleasantly on the roof. When the play was finished, the applause and the rain seemed to blend into one, each augmenting the other. 
There had been no theater in town for as long as anyone could remember. No one wanted to leave. Nelson, immersed in the chatter, felt warm. Then a bottle appeared, and the volume was raised, and the dancing soon began. Nelson stood against the wall, shy, but Cayetano and Patalarca sent Melissa across the room to pull him onto the floor. He took his first tentative steps to the beat, and Henry yelled, The city boy! his voice somehow carrying over the music and the rain. Everyone cheered. And this is when the tour finally seemed real to Nelson. Thank you. But of course, things can't go well, or else it wouldn't be a novel. Um, so the, the, the novel goes on, and, and it tells a bunch of stories at once. Um, it tells the story of the tour, and uh, where uh, they kind of accidentally run into, uh, into uh, Henry Nunez's his, his dark past. Um, and, uh, and, and that's one whole story. There's also a voice that I probably should have introduced or mentioned before I started reading. There was an I voice that many of you probably noticed and were like, what the hell is that? Um, there's a, the, the whole novel's being narrated by a character whom we don't meet until two-thirds or three-fourths of the way through the book. Um, so we know that he's there. We know that it's someone who's investigating, who's uh, kind of trying to figure out what's going on, who's interviewed all the main players in the story. Uh, but we don't exactly know why. And we don't know how he intersects with the story. Uh, I should be honest, I didn't know why or how either while I was writing. Uh, and that was actually one of the very exciting things about writing this book was I had no idea how it was going to end. Um, this probably explains why my books take me seven years to write. Um, but uh, that's just the way it works. Um, so there, the, the, I, I began by mentioning the prisons. Um, and there is uh, probably about, a, a, I don't know, a quarter of the book takes place inside one of the prisons as we get a lot of Henry's backstory and a lot of that explanation of that dark past that I mentioned. Um, and uh, and um, but, but a lot of, a lot of it is, is sort of set here in this play with these three characters, Nelson, Patalarga, and Henry, um, and their text, The Idiot President. So I'm happy to take questions about the book, any aspect of the book, the writing of the book, or any of the other things that I do. Yes, sir. I don't know your background, but uh, tell us, do you write in Spanish or English? How, how no. does that all work out? Um, well, I was born in Peru. Uh, I grew up in the United States. We moved when I was three. Uh, I grew up speaking Spanish in my house. Um, and speaking English everywhere else, um, at school and stuff. Um, so my first language is Spanish, but my, uh, the language I was educated in is English. Um, I do a lot of work in Spanish. I write in Spanish for different magazines. But when it comes to writing fiction, I almost always write in English first because it's easier. Um, writing a novel is so hard to begin with that I, I, it would be uh, uh, impossible. I can't, I can't conceive of adding another level of, of difficulty to it by writing it in, in my, let's say, my not strongest language. Now, I do a project called Radio Ambulante, which is basically um, the way I explain it to, to, to people in the United States is if you know the show This American Life, um, nod your head if you do. Yeah, OK. So it's, the, it's kind of like This American Life, but in Spanish and transnational. So we do stories from all over Latin America and the US wherever Spanish is spoken. Um, and, uh, and there, I'm the, I'm the executive producer. So I, all the scripts come through me. And I work with all the producers to make sure their stories are good. Um, and that I do all in Spanish. Um, and and, and, and uh, if that sounds contradictory, it's, uh, I would explain it this way. The, I mean, the, 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 sort of the register of the language that you have to use in radio is is sort of the register you use to tell your friends a story at a bar. And I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I mean, I'm, that's the Spanish that I feel comfortable um, speaking in, and, and I feel very comfortable telling stories at a bar. Um, but using the literary language of, of, you know, of Borges and Bolaño to me um, sounds, that's, that's, that's too much. That's a big ask. Um, but I, I like the, the, the oral Spanish. You know, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. Yes, ma'am. first-person statement when you were reading, the point of view felt almost omniscient. Yeah. 
Um, so that's going to become clear how the works out that there's this first person. Ideally, yes, <laughs> ideally. Or you'll throw the book across the room. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, yeah. so the first, you know, like there, there is that I. Whoever that is knows what's going on in other people's heads. Right? Well, because they've told him. Okay. Because he's gone around and asked everybody. Um, which is what I do all the time as a, as, as a journalist, you know, what were you thinking in that moment? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, for me it was, it was sort of like the, having two sources of narrative tension, two types of narrative momentum, you know, what's going to happen to Nelson and who the hell is telling the story. And um, I didn't know the answer to either of those questions, but I was interested in both. And, and I think a novel really can't survive, um, can't, can't hold itself up if it doesn't have you know, two parallel tracks at, the, at least uh, of, of questions, two parallel tracks of narrative momentum. Uh, otherwise, the whole, the whole structure collapses. And I know that because I wrote a first draft of this book that had no tension in it and just kind of floundered and, and was, you know, was just like a, a, like a sleeping cat of a novel. So, yes. Uh, thank you. Of course, thank you. Um, I see that your books are translated into Spanish. Yes. I'm curious to know how they've been received in Peru. Um, my books, the question was how my books been received in Peru. Uh, very well, I think. I mean, sur sur surprisingly well. I'm, uh, I I'm considered a Peruvian writer, you know, I'm, uh, which I'm very proud of. Um, I'm, I think, um, you know, I've been anthologized in a bunch of, you know, Peruvian or Latin and Latin American anthologies, even though my work is translated. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. In, in Peru is a country that, do, you know, we have a lot of, of outward migration, but um, but we don't have, uh, say, like Puerto Ricans or Mexicans ha have Boricuas in New York and Chicanos in California or, you know, all over the Southwest. So it's like, there's no sense of like the Peruvian abroad experience being a, a, a kind of collective extension of the nation. Like in the same way, like the, the the Puerto Rican diaspora is a thing. You know, the Mexican experience in the United States is a thing. The Peruvian experience is like Peruvians leave, and and since we go all over the place in relatively small numbers, we haven't congregated anywhere except Patterson, New Jersey, um, and now Santiago, Chile. So, for example, that's an interesting Peruvian experience that you could say is a Peruvian diaspora experience that, that has yet to be dramatized in a novel, uh, for example. So I think when I started writing in English, there was a big question about uh, in Peru about where I belonged, whether I was a Peruvian writer or not. And um, then when I went down to Peru and everyone heard me speak Spanish and sort of that I didn't speak like a, like a gringo, um, then there was even more sort of head scratching. Well, like if you speak Spanish, why don't you just write in Spanish? Um, and uh, which also elicited a bunch of strange responses, um, including one where in Chile I was called uh, in a in a in a my favorite review ever. Um, I was called uh, uh, a, like a Yankee interloper, uh, part of the Bush Cheney war machine, um, <laughs> trying to uh, to make everyone. Trying to anglicize Latin America or something like that, um, uh, which I thought was just terrific. Uh, I should mention that because so so I was also uh, in other reviews called a you know apologist for the shining path. So you can see how really novels are always open to interpretation. Um, so I'm either a member of the Bush Warney Cheney war machine or I'm a shining path member. I'll let you figure out <laughs> which one. Um, Anyway, yeah, so I think I've been well received in Peru. Yes, here and then here. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I have sort of a two pronged question. I'm, I'm curious if you have uh, uh, continued to inquire into the prison in Lima. And also, I know that there was an election in 2012, and uh, the man who got elected was Park Quechua, and he's also got socialist leanings. Do you, do, is your inquiry into th those aspects of? Could as well? Or yeah, more? well, OK. Uh, uh, there's a lot there. Uh, the, in the first part, yes, I have gone back to the prisons. I go back all the time. I was uh, working when I was at the, at the J school as a fellow. I was working on a lot of stuff having to do with drug trafficking. And so I 
definitely went back to my friends in the prison and asked them, you know, so how'd you wind up here? Um, so they could tell me about, about drug trafficking. Uh, and then went with some of the contacts they had into the, into the jungle. Um, so yeah, so I go back to the prison a lot. I, every time I'm in Peru, I go back to the prison. Um, I'll certainly be reading this book in, the, in Lurigancho when it comes out. Uh, in Spanish in April or May. The second part of your question about Umala, um, I mean, you know. Just maybe uh, a relationship to the prisons? Yeah, well, first of all, Umala is very related to the prisons because uh, he has a brother in prison. Um, he's not a socialist. Uh, he's, uh, I mean, he has that the problem that I think a lot of politicians in Peru have where if you want to win, you have to be a populist. But then you get in, and then they show you the books. You know, They're like, here's the accounting. And you know, the economy's growing 7% a year or something. And they're like, you know, so do you want to shut that off? And then he's like, no, I'm not going to shut that off. And that same thing happened with Toledo. Same thing happened with everybody. I mean, they go in, and they're like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, this, and this. But then they, they, they immediately get to the palace and change their tune to completely. Umala has done this to, to, a, to a really extraordinary degree. Um, I mean, I voted for Umala mostly because he wasn't Keiko Fujimori. Um, but I didn't vote for him thinking that he was going to be anything except what he is. Um, um, I don't know if I'll ever vote again in Peru. It was just, it's such a depressing. I mean, if voting in the United States is depressing. Voting in Peru is just extraordinarily depressing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, oh he, he was first, and then you. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I want to ask you to what extent you consider the setting of this novel to be Peru? Because in this and in La City Radio, um, a lot of the sort of chronology of the war and the geography and the references to Quechua feel a lot like Peru, but unlike in more of a candlelight in your first part of the story, you should have gone call with Peru, Peru, Peru. Yeah. Totally. That's a great question. I, I consider it Peru, of course. Um, it's a country I know well. Um, I, I mean, Lima is a place w where I spend a lot of my imaginative time, um, just walking the streets of that city. So, and it's, it's the city that I, that I, you know, um, I, don't, I think it might be one of the, maybe the city that I love the most of any city in the world. Not because it's beautiful, although it is at times, and not because it's like safe or lovely or has great weather, you know. Um, but you know, I, I, I love Lima in part because of what Lima has given me. You know, when I go to Lima, I can go spend time in Urigancho talking to, you know, thieves and murderers, and then I can have an appointment that afternoon with the minister. Of justice, you know what I mean? Like, there's there's very few places where I have that range of access, and um, and it's something that I've worked hard to get. But it also comes from this when I was much younger, a almost spiritual need to understand the city where I was born, um, and to understand what happened in that city while I was gone, and um, and the work that I did without even realizing what I was doing in my early twenties, uh, now feels like. Like it, it all set me up to do the work that I'm able to do now, um, you know, where where I, I have I have access, you know. Like I think if I were to, if I cared about San Francisco, and I honestly don't that much, um, but if I did, I live in San Francisco now, and I, I just don't feel identified with the city in any way. I live there, and it's fine, but I don't like connect with it, you know. But if I did, I would have to do a lot of work to get the level of connection that I have with Lima. Um, but so the question, uh, so yes, it is Lima, and yes, it is the Andes, and yes, you know, I took a trip just like this, and I've been to all these towns, and when I'm describing tea, I'm describing Corongo, you know, like when I, when I, um, and describing the, the 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 drug planes flying, it's because I've, you know, I've seen them, you know, it's like, I'm thinking about my country, um, and I do consider it my country, you know, um, but why don't I name it? I, I, I think. It's, it's just a question of gi giving myself creative leeway to do what I want, you know? Um, to not have somebody say, oh, oh yeah, that's not, it, Lima's not like that, or you got this detail wrong, or, you know, the, you know that, that bomb was in May, 
92, not April, you know, or whatever. Like, I don't want my book to be fact-checked. Um, I want it to create an, an, a, a fictitious version of the country that I love. Um, um, because it gives me room to play, you know? And for me, really, writing and, and, and fiction, writing fiction is play, you know, in the same way that reading is play, you know? It's like, it's gotta be pleasurable or else I don't understand why we're doing this, you know? There's plenty of boring things to do that we have to do, and I really do think it's important to, to tell a story that someone wants to know how it ends, you know? Yes? My question is actually very similar, but I don't know. <laughs> It's just that section of the room. Yeah. Um, because I wonder, not knowing much about Latin America, how sort of universal uh, it felt. To me, it could have been Peru, it could have been any one of a number of countries mm -hmm. that I don't really know very much about. That's <laughs> what I know. Right, right. Um, I wouldn't have known it was Lima or Peru if I hadn't. You know, like yeah, and, and, you know, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, so right, how many people in this room have never been to Lima? Right. OK, so most of you. So how do you know it's real? I mean, how do you know it actually exists, you know? Like, I mean, you know, how many of you have ever been to Narnia? You know, like, I mean, it's, it's literature, you know? It's art. And so I do think that you can, you know, like, it doesn't matter really at the level of human story whether Lima or Peru, can, you can, whether you can find it on a map. It doesn't matter. You know, what I'm writing about is uh, a set of characters, a, a young man with a predicament that I think, you know, I certainly can respond to and I think a lot of people can respond to, um, about a generation that, that really thought that art could change the world. I'm talking about Henry and Nunez and Pata Larga and that generation of, of, of artistas comprometidos, you know, who I have a lot of sympathy for, even though, I, I, you know, in the novel that they haven't partic aged particularly well, you know. Um, I'm not making fun of them. I, I love those guys. You know, I'm, they're my friends. I know them, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm writing about people in prison. You know, black people in prison uh, because of the circumstances that they were born into. You know, and, and even people who have done horrible things. You go to a place like Lurigancho, and you really can ask yourself: Does anyone deserve this? You know, um, no matter what crimes they might have committed. You know, it, it's a really, really terrible, terrible place. So. It doesn't matter, you know, to me if it's real or not. Um, you know, when I when I wrote my first book, and I did in the first book, as you mentioned, talk a lot about, uh, you know, mention Lima, mention Peru, mention the names. Um, uh, people would ask, sometimes come up to me. I had one one gentleman come up to me and say, you know, I've never been to Peru, you know, but it sounds a lot like Pakistan, you know, mm -hmm. and the the problematic the problems of, of of that I was describing of corruption and and crime and instability and tribalism and all this stuff that I was writing about in Peru, he was like, oh yeah, you know, you change the names, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, I do think there is some universality to it. Um, and, and maybe uh, leaving the name of the actual place out allows me to, to really mm -hmm. try to bring that out. Yes. I was going to say, ironically, that it does evoke place very strongly. That was one of its strengths. Yeah, but, but you know, the name of a place is the least important thing about it. I, you know? I don't mean that. I, I, I meant that it really transported me oh, good, to that good. place yeah. uh, and those towns. And so I thought that you did that so beautifully. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Yeah, I do. And, um, about the ending, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers, no spoilers. Yes, yes, you did. I mean, I don't think one of the central questions of this book is who has the right to tell which story. And I think um, for the journalists in the room, that, that great Janet Malcolm quote, which I can't remember exactly, but it's basically like any journalist who can't see how fraught their occupation is is either lying or an idiot. You know, It's, it's way better phrase than that. Um, you should look it up. Um, I should probably, I quote it so much that I should probably look it up myself <laughs> and memorize it. Uh, it's a great, it's a fantastic quote. Um, and I think the, 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 the same applies for, um, for novelists. I think, you know, there is a question of who has the right to tell which stories. And, and you know, believe me, if, if I, with all the privileges that I 
with all the unearned privilege that I have, um, walking into a place like Gurigancho and having people trust me and tell me their stories, um, if I don't think about that, then I, then I, then that, I think that is a, a, a real lack of, of of journalistic ethics and just human values. You know, like I do think a lot about it. If if it's okay to tell these things, now people come up and, and all the time on the bus and you know in the streets and in Lima for some reason I have this you know so people just tell me horrible things all the time. Um, it just happens, and uh, and I and I don't sometimes I don't know what to do with about it. Sometimes I don't do anything about it for many years, um, and uh, but then you go into prison and you are the outsider. Everyone wants to tell you their story because they think you can help them get out, and. Um, and it, it, it's a it's a really really weird position to be in, and it's a fraught position to be in. And I think it's important to know that. It doesn't mean that I don't write it. Obviously, I wrote the book, you know. Um, but it does mean that I I am concerned about it. Yes. In, the, oh. in looking back over the novels that you've written, how how do they uh, where do they come from? What, what's the spark that uh, launches you onto the well, story? Okay, the the spark for the novel. I mean, each, each novel is different. Each novel comes. From, each each story comes from a different place. But I, I think now that I'm, I'm about to be 37, when I was 20, so right out of college, I, I went and taught public school for two years in in Central Harlem, and then I I went back to Peru. And I think that year in Peru, I got to Lima in uh, August of 2001. I left New York City on August 11th of 2001, so just before 9-11. Um, Toledo had just come into power. Um, every day, there was a, it, was like, it was like Fujimori and Montesinos had you know, Peru in a vice grip. You know? That crumbled, and every disaffected, unhappy person, whether they were unhappy because their shoes were too tight, or because they had their pension stolen from them, or because their you know, cousin had been locked in jail or because, you know, they're, they'd been sterilized. You know, like all the horrible things that, that happened in the, that decade. Everybody went into the streets. So they saw Toledo and they saw democracy as, as, a, as an opportunity to like voice their concerns and voice their anger. And Toledo was, was the, the guy who, you know, had to endure uh, that sort of repressed uh, desire to speak, um, outrage, anger. Uh, you know, for years people didn't protest Fujimori because they knew, and then Fujimori falls, and Toledo never really came across as a very strong president. Um, um, and and so you know there were protests in in the center, in the centro every day, every single day. And I had to cross the centro every day to go to work, um, and I saw it every single day. And it was it was a real eye-opening experience. You know, it was a real eye-opening experience to take a bus ride three hours across town. Uh, it was a real eye-opening experience to go live in Lurigancho. I went to go live in San Juan de Lurigancho at the edge of the city. Moved from San Isidro, which is like a hoity-toity part of the city. Um, so I was tired of the three-hour commute, and I went to rent a room for like $20 in San Juan de Lurigancho, which was basically a barriada at the time. Um, you know, we didn't have running water, didn't have anything. Um, so, I mean, if anything sort of sparked me, or you'd say that my life as a writer, I think, began that, that year, living in San Juan de Rigancho, sleeping on, you know, in this room and, you know, hanging out in the neighborhood with the kids that were, you know, just a few years younger than me and going dancing with them and, like, playing soccer with them and, you know, doing all the things that I did that year. Um, uh, with no real, I had no real plan, you know, but I was just hanging out. Um, but everything that I've written since has been affected by that experience. Yes? So I want to ask you about like, writing non-fiction and writing short fiction. Mm -hmm. Any advice for starting writers? Mm. Like how do you know when to stop and when? Well, someone told me this once, that if you want to write a short story, well, the question was, how do you make a short story short? You start near the end, you know? Um, and, uh, and I think, 
it's something that you develop over time. You have this kind of narrative intuition of what 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 the story wants to be. Um, it's not something that you get right away. I think uh, uh, when I first started writing, I think this is common. When you're first writing, you don't have a sense of of what the what the length of the story is supposed to be. You want to write a story that's longer than 10 pages, but you can't because you can't think of plot. You know, generating plot when you're young is very hard um, because you just don't know what is supposed to happen in a story because you, you just don't understand what constitutes drama. Um, I mean, some people do, you know, and, and, and it's just that I found it very hard when I was 16 to write a story where it wasn't just like people talking, you know? Um, I think. Uh, you know, now I, I when I write a story, I think uh, I, I I you know don't begin with snappy lines of dialogue because that's not really what the story is about. That's the adornment. That's the the window dressing. Um, when you write, start writing stories, and they start getting longer and longer, longer, um, and that longer, like actually longer, and that more things are happening. That's when you sort of you. I'm sorry, you getting closer and closer to writing a novel. Um, I wouldn't. I mean. When I was younger, I never revised. I would write a story, finish it, put it away, and write the next one. Um, now I'm a, I'm a meticulous, obsessive uh, reviser. Um, and I, but I think that there, there was a lot to be gained from those very early years of just churning out a story and then doing the next one. Because um, none of them were very good, but I, I, I do think it was, you know, I, I did see a lot of my colleagues revising one story like four or five times, putting it up in workshop again and again and again until it had been workshopped to death and the life had been you know, taken from it. Um, and I think it's better to write something fresh and just keep moving and you know, put yourself, give yourself challenges. So in this story I'm going to write, I'm going to write a story where, where the, my hero does something, some, commits some act of treachery, but we still like him. Like how do you make that happen? Or um, I'm going to write a, a story with just two scenes, you know, or I'm going to write a story that is, um, you know, I, I, and pick a, a crazy setting, you know, um, and just give yourself challenges, and then and then do it, you know, and then don't look back. Just keep going. I think we have time for like one more question, and I wish I should sign some books if there's yes. Yeah, so yes, you. So uh, I actually landed upon an article that you wrote a couple of years back. I think it was in the Chronicle, and it was about your interaction with another Korean American person. And I think it ended something about how um, he said he loves Peru the way he loves the 49ers. Oh, that was a great moment. <laughs> I love that article. I'm, I'm also Peruvian American. Yeah. I just wanted to know, I feel like that article captured everything that I feel as being Peruvian American. And do you see yourself writing a book on that experience? I don't know. I just have to tell that anecdote because it was so amazing. Because um, I was just in some bar over like near the, near in San Francisco and I don't remember where in San Francisco. But this guy was maybe a little bit younger than me. Um, um, somehow was started showing off his. He had a, he had like tattooed a, a, a tumi on his back and and as it happens I have a, a like I went through a very patriotic phase and I have a the scars to prove it um, and a, a tumi tattoo as well. And so we started talking. And he got so emotional because we don't really meet many, you know, of us, you know. Um, and and at one point, after buying me many many rounds of, of, of beers, he kind of hugged me. And you know, he's a native San Franciscan, and he said this. He said that line, which I thought was so interesting. He said, "He's like, dog, I love Peru like I love the 49ers," <laughs> you know, which was so great because it, you know, like one is like a nation, and one is like a, you know. A football franchise owned by a millionaire, you know, it's like, it's just that they're, like, they can't be compared, and yet the fact that he held them in his heart and in his head in the exact same way, to me, I think, is a very, a very interesting way of thinking about nationalism and identity, you know? It's just two planks of his identity. It doesn't matter that one is like, you know, a country with a flag and an army, uh, you know, and a history and a capital and like a, you know, and the other one is, is a football team that's about to move to another town. You know, it's to him, it's the same. Um, I, I don't have any plans to write any any anything sort of specifically about that that identity. Um, you know, as often happens, I don't like I don't often write about myself. So I sometimes look for those questions that I'm interested in. I look for them in other situations or other contexts, and then write 
use other people to write about the things that are affecting me. So, um, so I'm more likely to like, you know, uh, go to Chile and 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 move in, you know, like do a deep immersion on in the Peruvian neighborhood in Santiago and write about I mixed identity there than I am to, to write about it myself. You know, I I, I went to uh, to Israel and Palestine in 2008, and I met I I, I there was there, I'd heard about these Peruvians <coughs> who'd converted to Judaism years ago in the 70s from a town called El Milagro, and so I just looked them up. I just uh, and I found the the settlement where they were living. Um, because basically, <clears throat> this priest was reading the Bible, and he realized the Americas weren't in the Bible, so he decided that they should all become Jews. And he wrote to uh, the, the, the Jewish community in Lima and was like, hey, we want to become Jews. And they were like, no, y'all are a bunch of Indians. Um, and so then they wrote directly to Jerusalem. And a rabbi came from Jerusalem to, to, to see if they were being Jewish. Uh, and they were. They were keeping kosher. And they'd all, all the men had gotten circumcised. And they were doing the whole nine. And uh, this was the middle of the first intifada. And the, the, the rabbi committee of rabbis was like, yes, y'all are Jewish. You can be Jewish. You can be Israeli on the condition that you move right now um, <clears throat> to the Green Line, basically. So they were like, "Okay, sure." And they did Aliyah and moved to Israel, and they put them like right on on the border, right next to to where most of the fighting was. <clears throat> anyway, I went to find these people, and it was fascinating because I saw a lot of my childhood in some ways. Even though I'm not Jewish, and my parents moved to the United States for purely secular reasons, um, whereas moving to Israel for them represented an entire sort of spiritual thing, obviously. Um, but the way that the parents spoke in Spanish to the daughter, and the daughter responded in Hebrew, uh, the way the parents clearly didn't understand really where they were, and the daughter did, you know, um, the way uh, the 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 parents talked about Peru, and the daughter both had a connection but didn't, but was clearly trying to assimilate into her Jewish settlement life. All her friends were, were like tall, white, Israeli girls, you know? Um, <clears throat> it was fascinating, totally fascinating. You know, but I'm more likely to write about that than I am to write about my childhood in Alabama, you know? Um, so, okay, thank you so much. Thank you for all your questions, it was great. And I'm happy to sign books. <laughs>